I start with uh, this question. Who is afraid of uh, vector calculus? I start with this question. Who is afraid of vector calculus? The purpose of starting like this is this. If the audience says nobody is afraid of uh, vector calculus, you can go for early lunch and now it's, <laughs> you don't have to be in this. <laughs> okay? But I think we all have some subconscious, some moment of uh, fear in the subconscious mind or somewhere about vector calculus. So perhaps uh, we can go through this, right? Because nobody is, uh, if everybody stands up and says we, uh, we are not afraid, the uh, course of the action uh, will be different. This is the plan of my talk. Now, don't think I have by mistake carried some other PowerPoint. Uh, it's actually a technical talk on vector calculus. And the learning objective is that at the end of it, you will understand all these pictures. You will start uh, liking vector calculus, or if you already like it, you will like it more. That is the learning objective of uh, next uh, one hour. Have a look at these pictures and uh, perhaps it is already triggering, it started uh, triggering something in your mind on the topic. Professor Vishnu gave a very short but very effective introduction to the concept of gradient. We will start with that. Before that, the scalation vectors. He told you what a vector is and uh, said I will uh, amplify on that. A vector, as all our students know very well, is something which has got magnitude and direction. So this is the aspect which was uh, discussed. Let us say something which has got a magnitude, 10 elephants, now a small magnitude, and a well-defined direction, a Trichu temple or Tirupati temple as you like. It's the east uh, nada of uh, that one. So there is a vector, there is a direction, and it, there is a magnitude. Or if you are not impressed, let me present you directly something with a magnitude uh, and a direction. That is an ideal example of a vector quantity, looks like. No. We know that we have seen the technical aspect of it earlier. This is not a vector quantity. Then what is the vector quantity? If something has got a magnitude and direction in a well-defined, very clear manner, does not uh, qualify as a vector quantity. So what you should do is turn the vector around, turn the elephant around, and look for its reaction, if you are bold enough to do vector calculations. So this is what a vector is. You define it in terms of certain transformations. If the components transform in this manner as specified with this, we know this, and then only it is defined as a vector. So vectors, scalars, tensors, etc., are defined in terms of the transformation properties. So what is a scalar then? Simple. Scalar is which one which does not transform at all. They are all actually the younger uh, brothers of uh, tensors, the family called uh, tensors, there is a problem with the tensors. I've been teaching for several years. In every one of the class, be it PhD or B.Tech or uh, MSc, the moment I say the word tensor, students become tensor and tensor. <laughs> there is no need. It is something to help us. The whole notation is something to help us to put our complicated mathematical expressions in a simple manner. That's the purpose of uh, introducing not only tensor, any mathematical concept, including that of uh, vector calculus, which we are going to see. Is it uh, too mathematical? Is this is, uh, going to be too mathematical? There is a quote here which says, if you want to read the book of the universe, you must know its language, which is mathematics. Who said so? The father of experimental physics. And the father of experimental physics must be the grandfather of engineering. <laughs> <laughs> engineering came out of physics, right? And this is nothing, none other than so this, he is the grandpa of engineering, who said. So engineering students, civic students, all have to learn this language. So they want to do their job properly. That's what we are going to see. Great grandfather of technology. Yeah, great grandfather of technology. 
the concept of gradient is also explained to you as a limit. We will look at the three concepts of vector calculus, gradient, divergence, and curl, as some limiting process, an expression which describes a limiting process, each one. Let us start with defining a unique vector as shown here. It's the limit of dr by dr. We will see what it is as we proceed. Let us look at the concept. You want to climb down a mountain. There is an earthquake or something in your address to climb down. So how will you climb down? At any point where you are, there are different ways of climbing down, different directions through which you can climb down. So proportional to how much you move in the x in the plane, how much for example, there are different ladders. Ladders can be cut like this, cut like this, like this. So how many steps you have to take to cover a large height? That is the question, as is evident from this definition, what is going to come. So let us define some quantity called gradient, as shown here. This quantity, gradient, let us start by defining it. Let us call it in, give it a symbol, and then define this. So dot product, this dot product it is a radius. What it is physically we will see. It's one way of looking at it is to call it by name and then start describing it. So this is a dot product and it gives a rate of change, spatial rate of change of the field in a particular direction. U is any direction and the rate of change in that direction is decided. Now we have to ask just one question, when is it a maximum? and then we get the concept of gradient. In other words, I will explain all this. Gradient is the greatest slope. If you want to descend, of course, from the mountain you want to descend, then you are talking about the negative gradient. You want to descend in the most efficient manner. That is what is meant by this dr by ds and the limit of that. So if you want to know the gradient, if you want to know d psi by ds, how much change per step you get, then you have to take this uh, product this dot product. So that gives you this, where u is defined like this. This is what Professor Deshmukh was uh, mentioning earlier. It is important to realize that gradient of a scalar field is a vector field. It is related to the directional derivative and gradient is the maximum directional derivative. Where is the concept maximum coming from? It is because it is a dot product, you know, whether it is maximum and when it is uh, minimum and all that. So the quantity, the scalar quantity psi, which can be anything, any scalar quantity, this quantity increases most rapidly along the direction of the gradient. And it decreases most rapidly in the direction of the negative gradient. Why is it important? Often we have to make a judgment in which direction we have to run to escape a, a particular field, like temperature. Temperature is a scalar quantity. So the uh, I have seen uh, some movie where uh, the villain will be, the hero will be uh, captured in a place called uh, absolute zero temperature, liquid helium. It's not possible to have such a big chamber, but then he is supposed to, he wants to run away and go to the normal temperature. So which direction he should run? He has to make a decision to overcome the temperature gradient and come to normal temperature, room temperature. So his neck top has to do this uh, calculation and find out the direction of the gradient. It is the direction of the gradient which gives the direction in which the change is maximum. So which direction you will run depend upon whether you want to escape the change or not. For example, force is a negative gradient. Why is it the negative gradient of potential? Force is defined as a negative gradient of a potential in the case of conservative uh, force states. That the negative uh, helps us to get the work energy theorem right. <coughs> Let us look at this maximum directional directive, uh, derivative in a little more detail. The definition is here. This quantity, this uh, d psi by ds will be maximum when this quantity, the new quantity which you have defined is parallel to the direction in which you are moving. So in other words, grade 5 has a direction and magnitude of the greatest rate of change of the scalar function. In the uh, case of the height, it is uh, very clear in which direction you have to go so that you get a maximum ascent which way you should keep the ladder so that you climb larger number of steps per equivalent uh, uh, number of steps along the x direction or along the plane. The other aspect of it is, is as I said, it decreases most rapidly in the direction. Why I am talking about decrease? Because often we want to escape a gradient, escape from a gradient. 
as I said, the negative sign has to do with our choice of uh, discussing what is lower and what is higher. The other aspect of this is the direction of the gradient is also perpendicular to an EQ potential surface. So it is very easy to find an EQ potential surface. Look for the direction of the gradient and see. Because on that D psi is zero, there is no change. EQ potential means there is no change in the potential. Flat surface geometrically. If we can prove it easily, let us assume a vector which is lying on this EQ potential surface and then calculate uh, D psi by DS which is equal to uh, the gradient of psi, the dot product of psi and gradient of psi and B. So this is for a non-zero. If gradient is non-zero, then it has to be perpendicular to B. That's the only way we can have this so zero. So that proves that the direction of the gradient is perpendicular to the equipotential surface. This, have, uh, this has uh, a physical significance which we will see shortly. To repeat, the directional derivative d psi by ds has a maximum value when taken in a direction parallel to the gradient and it is zero when it is taken in a perpendicular direction. It is a directional derivative, derivative taken with a concept of a direction associated with it. This is a vector point function, gradient is a vector point function. Let us look at some simple examples to get the idea clearly in our mind. The function, the scalar function is given as t equal to 20 plus x plus y, where the constants are the proper dimension, do not worry about the visiting meaning of it. Let us just look at it uh, mathematically first. This is a plot of a temperature, uh, that temperature is a function of x and y position. So this is uh, what I have plotted here, x and y here. The brighter regions have uh, larger values of temperature. The darker regions, colder region are uh, shown with bluer and uh, brighter ones are, uh, uh, sorry, the brighter ones are uh, have larger temperature and the darker ones lower temperature. So find out the, let us find out the gradient of this. This is very simple and let us calculate the gradient of this. If you do that by the usual uh, vector, uh, methods of vector calculus, you get this what you get is field is this. So let us look at the function. This is the gradient is E x plus E y. One along E x and one along E y. And that will, uh, can be plotted like this. So that shows the direction. This shows the arrow shows the direction from pole to hot. So this is what I have, I was uh, trying to explain by right, conceptually. And that is a vector field. So the gradient can be depicted by this picture here. This is one example. Let us go to another example, little more complicated, 20 plus uh, x plus y and uh, here again, so the, the, this is, uh, sorry, this is not 20 plus x plus y, this is uh, not correct, this is uh, 100 plus x y, 100 plus x y, that is plotted here and if you look at the gradient, the gradient is going to be in this direction. So the similarly, you can, uh, now let us go to a cylindrical polar coordinates. This is a simple equation again, T is 15 plus rho cos phi. It's rho and phi have the normal meanings in the case of uh, plane polar coordinates. Again, the same thing, the concept is the same, we plot T and then we plot the gradient of it. Here, you can work out the gradient if you will talk about how to get the expression for gradient, etc. later. And you see that it is Ex. What does it mean physically? That, that's why I showed this. So the, it is easier to see in the rectangular coordinate system, the answer of this. Otherwise, this is the answer. Now you see that it is equal to Ex, which means this, the gradient is along the axis. That's what it means, with the magnitude unit. So this way, you can calculate for a given function. You can visualize how the function behaves and how the gradient behaves. And you can, again, this is clearly shown here by the shading that uh, the direction of gradient is like this. Let us understand gradient. We all know from school days onwards that water flows downhill. Water flows downhill is actually a statement of a gradient. We are talking about flows. So when we go, we go to the college, school we know that water flows downhill. In the college we learn whatever flows, flows downhill. Everything flows downhill. What do I mean by whatever? I mean all that. I am talking of transport properties. Transport properties means somebody is running away with something. What is he running away with? 
liquid flow, current flow, charge running away with charge, running away with heat, running away with momentum, also flow. Running away with particles, all these are called a different transport uh, phenomena. In this case, you have liquid flow, current flow, heat flow, particle flow, all these have mathematically similar expressions governing this. And in all these cases, there will be a gradient. For example, where does current flow? From a higher potential to the lower potential. And uh, where does heat flow? Again, from a higher potential to the lower potential. And the con particles, where do particles flow? From a higher concentration to the lower concentration. Where does money flow? From the poor to the rich. <laughs> so that, that means it's all branches of engineering and finance. Gradient is, can be used to describe all branches. Each one is a, a branch of an engineering. Any branch of an engineering discipline. So that is the importance of the concept of gradient. And once you look at some of the, you may have looked at uh, some of these equations, you'll realize what I'm talking about. The similarity in expression, mathematical expression, and the concept of gradient. Some examples from the familiar uh, electric field and potential. We have, we know this uh, electrostatic field, which is a nice conservative field. Electrostatic field inside a conductor is zero. These are the things which we teach our students. What is the connection with gradient? If it is not, the situation will not be electrostatic anymore. Induced charges, induced fields, etc. tend to cancel the original field. That is the way it is uh, arranged. Any net charge resides only on the surface, not inside. What will happen if, it, these are the common things which we teach uh, students. A conductor is an equipotential. So all this is related to, this can be explained quantitatively using what we learned just now, the concept of the gradient. The field lines just outside the conductor must be perpendicular. This is another important aspect of the electric. This is just to give you a flavor of where it can be used, this concept which we learned right now can be used. You can uh, understand it by this uh, converting a field into a potential or finding out the field corresponding to a potential or vice versa. This problem, for example, gives an electrostatic field and we are finding out the potential from which it has come. It can be done both of these are standard problems, graphic level problems, which you are all familiar with. I am just bringing in the, uh, how it is related to the gradient. Then obtaining the potential from a given field, field from potential, potential from field. I guess that you will be familiar with this, only connect it with the, the topic. In, uh, in the case of, uh, for example, here, in this case, we must know what is, what is meant by the constant. That is, again, uh, standard. Constant here means it is independent of the variable involved. So this is to obtain the standard problems to get field from the potential or vice versa. Then you can plot all this nicely. Depending upon which expression you take, you can uh, plot it and show the gradient also. Let's go to divergence. Divergence, before talking about divergence, let's, uh, uh, divergence we will understand conceptually, we will also write the expressions and we will also talk a little bit about the physical meaning of this. The divergence theorem which I am going to describe, I not described it yet, is a mathematical expression of the conservation principle. What it conserves, we will see. It is best illustrated by recognizing that in the absence of any source or sink, the density of matter in a well-defined volume can change if and only if, uh, uh, if matter flows in or matter flows out. We will see that. We'll elaborate on this. There are some very nice uh, things uh, which Lotz uh, has mentioned. You can read that. The enchanting charms of this sublime science appeal only to those who have the courage to go deeply into it. Let's say I use the word fear in my title. I have had my results for a very long time, but I don't know how to arrive at this. Mahatma Gandhi said not only the final goal, but also the method to arrive at that also should be pure. That is why he was uh, waiting for finding out a mathematically the equivalent here is a logical way of uh, describing it. When you talk about divergence, the idea that comes to our mind immediately is that of the flux. What is the difference between flux and divergence? Why do we need two different concepts to describe if it is the same thing? Flux crossing a surface is given by this surface integral. The surface say, A, F dot DA, or I, I have used both F dot DA or F dot DS alternatively. Both. To define a flux, you need a vector 
and a surface, a vector field and a surface. So if students have a problem in uh, remembering how to define a plus, this picture they can, uh, in the Tamil equivalent of uh, that will be the bullfight, not only in Spain, we have in Tamil also, okay. So that shows that uh, you must have a field and you must have a surface. It can be a closed surface, both the uh, bull and you can be enclosed in a nice enclosure, that is extreme uh, divergence, okay. So you need, a, you need to define flux, you need a vector and a surface, that's what this integral tells you. You could, the surface can be of uh, different kinds, then you have to define this is important. I have shown it as an area. You know the concept of the directed area. The direction of an area, it is outward drawn normal. For a flat surface, of course, there is an ambiguity. There is no outward drawn normal. You can take element by element and find out the total flux which emanates from it. It's an additive property. So these pictures show how the, the show a field and an area, a field and an area, and how the flux can be defined using calculus. So this, uh, okay, I will, we will now define, a force is a vector point function, but the problem, the issue is flux is not a vector point function. First of all, it's not a vector. It's not defined at a point. Flux is defined only over a surface, not over a point, at a point. This is a standard textbook derivation of what I am going to show the meaning of uh, geometrical meaning of uh, or physical meaning of also the physical meaning of flux. This is standard textbook thing so I am not uh, going to describe it. The idea involved here is to find out how much flow is there across each surface. Consider two points uh, close by points and look at the flow through each one. So you can do it in a step by step manner, take uh, each pair of faces and find out how much is going, then add all them, all of them up, then you get an expression like this. The flux, this is standard textbook thing, you can see it in the textbook. The flux is given by this quantity, the bracketed quantity of the integral of the bracketed quantity. So we have a volume integral here. Now, if you define this quantity as the divergence of x and write it in this fashion, then you can define the flux in this manner. So we have the Gauss's divergence theorem, which connects the volume integral into a surface uh, integral. It relates the surface integral and the volume integral. The surface and volume are related. It is the surface which goes around and surrounds this particular volume, which you are talking about. That is the connection between the V and S or V and A, as I have used to, that encloses this particular surface. Now let us look at the meaning of it. So what we have done so far is we have looked at uh, the uh, the flow of uh, the flux, uh, considering two surfaces. Then we considered all surfaces and got an expression. You can you can believe me. You can get an expression like this, and then we called it a name. By this we call it as a divergence of f, and then we have this equation. So this is a volume integral of this quantity, and this is surface integral. And this is where our divergence is. Now let's try to define it. Let's look at the physical meaning of uh, what is exactly diverging, what is meant by divergence, and what is the relation between flux and divergence. This is nicely shown by this limiting case. As I said, we will we have already looked at gradient as a limiting case. Now we look at divergence as a limiting case. The flux cannot be defined at a point. Flux is defined for an area. Suppose we were to shrink that area. It is like the famous uh, example given by Richard Feynman when he discusses the uh, velocity as a quantity, uh, the definition of velocity by calculus. The famous example in which the professor is driving a car at uh, 70 kilometers per hour and the police uh, stops him and says, you are going at 70 kilometers per hour. Then the professor says, neither I am going for 70 kilometers, I am going only for 2 kilometers and uh, I am not going for 1 hour, uh, there is a lecture after 5 minutes. So what is your problem? Then he says, no, no, don't argue with me. If you go like this, you will uh, cover 70 kilometers. Can't you see, if I go like this, I will hit against that wall. If I go like this, I will hit against that, then the curve on the road. And who told you I am going to go like this in future? No, no, if you go like this, you will cover, he is repeating that again. 
Oh, I will cover one hour, 70 kilometers after one hour. Come and arrest me after one hour. <laughs> you, cannot be arrest, you cannot arrest anybody for, for something he is going to do after one hour. <laughs> you, so you can, when you drive, you can uh, keep it. Uh, remember this. <laughs> the fellow so will get sufficiently confused and then he will escape the consequences. This man gets very annoyed. He says, don't cheat me. At this instant, you are going at 70 kilometers per hour. In the process of it, at this instant, I am here. At this instant, we are all sitting comfortably here. We are not going anywhere. So, what is your problem? The answer cannot be given by an ordinary policeman. So, what is the answer? Honest can be only given by a physics teacher or a math teacher. Where we invoke the concept of limit. That's where we invoke the concept of limit. Consider a very small displacement and consider the time taken for that displacement and then take the ratio delta x by delta t tending to zero, delta t tending to zero and that is the limit of uh, So, that is the concept here. We take these quantities, we take this integral which are defined just now here and consider a small volume and define the limit this volume integral. So, we consider look at the limit of this and that limit can be defined as a delta. Okay. So, it is defined now at a point, the volume shrinks and at that point, so we are asking at that point what is the flux, it is something like that. So, this is the concept as a limit and we have to remember that flux is not a scalar field event, it is not a local quantity whereas divergence gives you the same information in the form of a field, it is a scalar, scalar field at that point, local quantity. That is what you get out of this. Now, we have Gauss's divergence theorem, let us look at it in a little more detail. This connects the volume integral, it is as I said. So, this uh, is so people do not like volume integrals, they like only surface integrals or vice versa, they can use this. Often we use this trick to jump across uh, dimension, jumping across dimensions uh, conceptually. The surface integral statement is this, the surface integral of the normal component of the vector f taken over a closed surface is equal to the integral of the divergence of f taken over the volume enclosed by the surface. Please note that these are uh, the surface uh, and volume are related to each other not any arbitrarily any surface or anything like that. So, here the surface integral of a vector field is related to the volume integral of divergence of that vector field. What it means is an integration of the sources or sinks of a vector field over a volume provides the next, the net outflow going through it. This is like some gardening issue to give a very crude analogy, it is like a gardening issue you have several fountains and then several holes through which water can drain off and then you are looking at finally how much water is leaking to the neighbor's uh, backyard, front yard and that is what you are. The neighbor complains that there is a leakage of to their front yard. So, what will you do? You go around and count how many fountains are there and how many holes are there through which water goes in and finally, if they do not match with each other, if there is only one fountain and no hole, then all the water goes to the, uh, the neighbor's uh, wall. So, that is a it's like a stock taking in some sense. It is a crude example, but it is a stock taking in some sense of uh, what is happening in the garden, in a flow, in the case of water flow, that is what I use. The better example will be the electrostatic field. The electrostatic field, you know the electrostatic field and uh, what is the divergence of the electrostatic field also. So, you can represent it like that. So, what I said just now is this, integration of the faucet, the source or the sink will be equal to the flux of water flowing out from the surface and closing the volume. The surface integral of a normal component of the vector taken uh, over a closed surface is equal to the integral of the divergence of the vector taken over the volume enclosed by the surface. This is the same thing, same, same thing. So, gradient was a mountain. Uh, when we talk about gradients, we talk about mountains and we talk about divergence, we are talking about fountains. This is the example in a better way. You see the the divergence clearly stares at you in this picture. This is a charge, positive charge sitting there. It is a fountain and if the negative charge sitting there, goes in the other direction. So, this is the concept of Maxwell's equation. You can clearly see what Maxwell's equation, Maxwell's equation in electrostatic says. That is the physical meaning of, one way of understanding the physical way of uh, meaning of, it is an example actually, it is meant as an example. You can do this, you can actually solve this. Uh, the, uh, this is the Gauss's theorem, the famous Gauss's theorem, Gauss's law, which you can uh, actually derive using this which you just mentioned. It is interesting to see that the flux is independent of the radius. 
how is it possible i give it leave it as a homework or you think an interesting homework special homework will be what is the divergence of a uniform okay. constant constant is the word normally used but constant is actually in time but if uh, here the very the differentiation is done on space not on time so uniform is a word better word by the, the you can use the divergence theorem let's play with the divergence theorem a little bit let us uh, calculate the e dot uh, ds here and using the idea we have developed just uh, here just now we can write it uh, like this and then you get a maxwell expression as i was telling so this is the meaning of the picture which i showed here please try to correlate that equation and this picture then you understand divergence this picture this picture This is a differential form, local form. This is the first Maxwell's equation, which is uh, actually Coulomb's law. Visualizing this by examples. This is a question where the divergence is zero. This is an example of a visualization of a field where the divergence is zero, and here it is. It has some value, some numerical value too for this particular field. You can calculate it by the standard uh, method. So here, in this case, why is it zero? Conceptless. I just answered conceptually. The influx uh, solenoidal. The case of solenoidal. The divergence of a vector field is the extent to which the flux lines behave like being near a source or a sink. There is another way of looking at it, physically. You can see there are sources and sinks in general. In general, in your garden, there are fountains and uh, holes. and then the input so we relate the sources the sinks and the net flow so inflow outflow total flow that's what we are looking at if there are no sources and sinks then whatever goes in must come out so now we are talking about a principle of conservation this is the, uh, i uh, bring back the definition of this then if you apply it, uh, this to electro uh, statics again you have to consider j a current and then you look at the divergence of j and then you arrive at the equation of continuity these are simple steps we do in our uh, graphic theory electromagnetics you teach in bsc physics perhaps what you get is uh, this equation now let us analyze this equation so ah equation of continuity this equation tells you about a vector j right now we are we, we can talk about electro uh, dynamics or uh, even without electro dynamics okay let's set take some vector j its divergence is negative of d rho by dt that's what it says this equation tells us gives us the meaning of the divergence the divergence of this vector is equal to the change in uh, in the rate the rate of accumulation or otherwise of uh, a quantity a scalar quantity some quantity let's understand it this can be the equation of continuity which relates to the conservation of mass or conservation of charge in the electrostatic case which we were uh, at recently uh, we were talking about uh, now it's charge conservation or if you look at it as a flow of matter then it is a conservation of mass then the rho becomes a density of matter here it's the charge density okay so this equation tells a lot of things it talks about the conservation of mass conservation of matter or conservation of charge both in the context appropriate context this is the importance of the equation of continuity divergence theorem is actually a mathematical expression for a conservation principle it implies it implies the conservation principle in the absence of creation or destruction of matter no sources or things the density within the region of space can change only by having matter flow into or out we will put it in say it in different uh, languages this is what we said just now we can understand this we can look at this example so one is one way of looking at this will be i think i have it later so i'll come back to that so let's summarize what we learned about divergence we started with uh, this it started with flux and then we wrote this integral and we define divergence as a local quantity we can look at look at the limiting the case of uh, limiting case of uh, flux this integral in particular at a particular uh, by divided by the volume and we found a local quantity and then we looked at the divergence 
the, the continuity, equation of continuity. The one way to tell, uh, to make our students understand this is like this. Suppose they are staying in the hostel and their father is sending them money. If they go around seeing all movies, buying all things and uh, all that, if you keep diverging your money, then remember there is a negative uh, accumulation of the bank balance of the father. This is their divergence of money and this is the bank balance of the father, it goes uh, negative, dr by dt. There is a decrease in the bank balance of the father. So that is what it is. It is a consideration of money in financial thing. So in, uh, even in a country, in a country there are some developmental projects, lot of uh, people taking drive, so sources and things are there. So the finance minister has to actually learn divergence theorem and how to see how to manage all these uh, corruptions and uh, the things and sources uh, in the finances and uh, uh, somehow manage it. So students should find it very difficult to understand the concept of divergence in spite of all that. But uh, divergence is actually your, uh, their friend. We come to curl. We start on our journey on curl by looking at uh, looking at going back at gradient once again. So it's for us to fix our uh, ideas in our mind. We define uh, quickly a quick hour uh, recap of uh, what we did for uh, the directional derivative and gradient. This is what we did. We looked at the limiting case of uh, dr by ds. And then we said the direction in which it happens, the grade of maximum uh, happens is the direction of the gradient. The maximum change happens along the direction of the gradient. Now look at uh, this. There are two equations on for, of uh, one is f equal to m and the other one uh, is, uh, is a gradient, a negative gradient. This is the negative spatial gradient of a potential in the case of a conservative force. How do we reconcile these two? There are two equations here. The point is that the compatibility of the two expressions emerges if and only if the potential psi is defined in such a way that the work done by the force is given by this quantity, negative gradient. In displacing the object, work done by the force, force is given by this quantity, work done by that force in displacing the object on which the force acts, that is what it is. So this is the force and we are looking at the work done. If the work done has to be independent of the path, if work done has to be independent of the path, then only both of them are reconciled. So in other words, we find that this works for a conservative force field. We can write this only for a conservative force field. This, uh, we know this for electrostatic force or gravitational force, the work done is independent of path and in a closed loop, the work done is zero. So this is possible only with that. So the path dependence of this integral is completely equivalent to an alternative expression which can be used to define a conservative force. And that is brought out by the definition of curve. What is this curve? For a vector field F, we can define curve. Curve is a vector point function. It is defined, it is a vector first of all and it is defined at every point of the vector field F, such that for an orthonormal basis set of unique vectors, this you can write this expression. Of course, you are more familiar with the standard expression, then it's fine. Now, this is related to circulation. We talked about the directional derivative and then we came to the gradient as a limiting case. Then we talked about the flux and then we took the direction, we took a limit of that and then came to the divergence. Now, we talk about circulation. Just like the flux is defined with a point and uh, with a, sorry, with a force and an area, circulation is defined with a closed path. And circulation is only over a closed path and not at a point. So how do you describe the circulation at a point? Again, in the spirit of uh, Feynman's example, that is what we have here. So you take uh, so the curl A is defined like this. Curl A is defined like this. To understand that, take one of its authors, that is its projection in one direction. We don't understand infinity, we don't understand something like divine or God. So we take it, but it better to understand some of his authors. So we take the author of curl along this direction, along a direction and try to understand that and then we can extract stuff like that. So this, this particular component of the new thing which is curl, which I not uh, properly defined yet, that quantity, that, that dot product is equal to again a limit. What is the limit here? Here we have this line, the, the uh, circle, circulation and 
per unit uh, surface that's what the delta s that will give you this so that is a little a, a little tougher to understand compared to what we did earlier flux and divergence but if you understand that properly it becomes easier for you to look at this so here uh, Close yeah, close part. This is circulation. That's what I said, circulation. So look at circulation and then take the limit at a point. The point at which you want to define it, what is the circulation? Circulation is not at a point. Circulation is across a curve, a closed curve. But you can define it, if you want to define a point function which conveys the same idea, then you can define it at a point. That's what we are trying to do here. Then you can write it in uh, different coordinate systems. I will come back to that if time permits. This is independent of this way. If you define it this way, it is independent of any particular coordinate frame. The average circulation. So one physical meaning of curl will be the average circulation per unit area taken at that point where the elemental area becomes infinitesimally small. Just like the find an example, we have now an area and we shrink the area and look at that. So this is the meaning of this. The average circulation per unit area taken at the point where the elemental area becomes reduces to almost a point. This is the spirit of uh, this definition. The limit when the area becomes unitary. Okay. Let's try to understand it a little bit more. First of all, this is, uh, uh, this is circulation. And circulation is on the field, as I said. So, shrink this curve. First look at the circulation. At the circulation depends upon the vector at all points on C on the curve which you are talking about. We are taking an integral just like the case of flux. Then shrink that curve in the limit the circulation vanishes. Okay. So, so does the area. So, this is something like 0 by 0. But in the limit, no, it uh, does not really vanish in the limit. In the limit we can define the curve. The ratio is finite in the limit and this local quantity at that point is defined as so that's the meaning of, uh, I'm repeating what I wrote earlier to emphasize the point that it's a limiting circulation per unit area. That is mathematically what the curl is. Curl means how much a vector curls around the point. That's the physical or geometrical significance of this. About a point, how much the vector curls around. So you can, uh, so right now you let us associate a curl with a rotation. Quickly, I am going to tell you that uh, it's not necessary all the time. So this is the picture you can have in your mind: circulation and the limit. How much uh, the uh, circles around at that point is not circling around at that point. That is the concept of the limit. There is a famous uh, example given by Feynman. How to understand is the physical meaning of curve. He says, imagine a flow of. Uh, uh, let's imagine the flow of water an arbitrary flow of water. It need not be a very uniform flow. And then you consider a path across the flow, a, a tube across the flow. The tube is an imaginary tube. So water flows through the tube. I mean, it's just you're putting a line, drawing a line there, and water is flowing through that. Then he says, abracadabra, and all the water freezes, except that in the tube. Okay, is it clear? Water is flowing, and you, are, uh, you consider a loop, or actually a tube, Imaginary tube, water flows through the tube, uh, whatever you define the tube also. But then you freeze all the water except for what goes into it. And then you look at whether it is rotating, whether there is a motion inside. If, if so, then you bring it to a point and at that point there is a non-vanishing curl. That is Feynman's uh, first term, what a curl is. So curl is uh, now related to a some rotation, some level of rotation. I will again uh, give one more example for that. So, then there would be no rotation if it is uh, irrotational. This is called irrotational if it is uh, zero. Conservative force is <laughs> irrotational. Assume. So, we can look at the connection between all this gradient, in this case, gradient, circulation, and curl. Let's look at some points. The curl of a vector field at a point represents the net circulation of the field around that point. Circulation is uh, that integral. The magnitude of curl represents a maximum circulation at any point. The direction is given by the right hand rule is normal to the surface upon which the circulation is latest. The circulation can depend upon where this. So this direction is the normal to this 
circle which you consider on which it is uh, greatest. Just like the example of a uh, gradient, you can have different paths and you can have different, uh, if you put your ladder in different uh, manner, you will be climbing so much like that. And if it is zero, it is called irrotational for obvious reasons. Electrostatic, gravitational or uh, uh, rotation is where they call it uh, zero. So what you have to remember is that the criter criterion that a force field is conservative is that its path integral over a closed loop is zero. If this is zero in a region, then there will not be any curliness or rotation, rotation associated with it. This is a repetition of what I said just now. Examples in real life. A, torn a tornado that winds, uh, winds rotates about the eye and the velocity field. Now we are talking about the velocity field. The vector involved is the velocity. Would have a non-zero curl at the eye and possibly at other places as well. That is uh, an example of the concept of curl. If a, in a vector field that describes the linear velocities of each part of a rotating disk, the curl will have the same value on all parts of the disk. We'll come back to this point. The velocities of cars on a freeway were described by a, if, if that were described by a vector field and the lanes had a different speed limits, then the curl on borders between the lanes would be non-zero. I will explain this also in a, a simpler way. So let us uh, go, go ahead. If you get the circulation on the other faces and add up this, just like our, uh, okay, what we, what is this? This is the textbook derivation of uh, the equation which I am going to derive. The textbook derivation is like this. It takes along different directions, something like uh, what we did for divergence. And finally, you can derive this the Stokes theorem. This can be, the derivation can be found in any textbook on this. And this, now look at this. Here we have a line integral and here we have surface integral. And again, jumping across dimension. This is the Stokes theorem. This is how uh, we write uh, normally curl is remembered by students. But remember that it is not a determinant. If you don't remember, it will be determinant to your uh, knowledge in physics and mathematics. This is just a menon, an easy way of uh, understanding the whole thing or easy way of working out. This is a more decent way of writing curl. This is also good because uh, we are going to uh, give the secret how to remember these things. This is uh, the field which you have seen earlier, and here is a curl here, non-zero curl, and in this case also there is a non-zero curl. The direction and the magnitude of the curl can be found. Now look at this. So far, we were always talking about rotation. The moment I said curl, I was having this picture in all the slides for curl. So, is it necessary to have rotation all the time when the curl is involved? No. The best example will be if you, somebody is really very eager and very uh, curious to know about this point. Do we need always rotation to have a curl, to define a curl? Can we define a uh, curl when the field, uh, field lines are parallel? Have to do a simple experiment. You have to go to the uh, main gate of IIT and there are uh, vehicles coming at different speeds. And let's assume that that stretch of the road is parallel and just lie down on the board, uh, on the road and see whether your leg and the head are rotated with respect to each other. Okay, you will soon find that when uh, one car with, uh, hits uh, your leg at some speed and uh, another one hits your head at a different speed, so you rotate. Okay, so in this case also you can have a curve. The field, this is what is mathematically shown here, V is X, V, Y here. Okay, so there is a curve existing there. So in flow in reverse, the boat gets uh, tilted, is what I am talking about. So we can actually mathematically show this. Zero curl does not necessarily mean that the streamlines are not circular or circulation is zero. That's what I want to see. Some examples. Look at this field. You can see this is from uh, uh, Berkeley series book and uh, you can see all this is uh, given there. So I'll just quickly go through this. In this particular field, can you see the field line clearly? Yeah, the reason is also given there. Dive uh, of uh, this whatever field is depicted here is zero and curl is also zero. Field lines are straight, not curved, but the curl is not zero. Sorry, curl is non zero. I said curl is zero, curl is non zero. Though it is so, the curl. This can represent something going very fast and something going very slow. So if you lie down like this, you will rotate. The curl is non zero, though the field, field lines are straight. 
this is the next picture. In this case, we have the divergence non-zero but curl is here. So, picture looking at the picture alone may be de de uh, deceptive. So, we have to look at the argument by which it is. So, it is there in the textbook. So, I will not uh, spend much time on it. This is where the divergence is zero, curl is also zero. The whole straight lines look very confused. This is the case where divergence is zero, curl is also zero. Why is it zero? That is interesting. You should go to the book and read why it is. Another example where the curl is not zero here, but divergence is zero. The example is given. This is again straight away from the book. You can go back and look at it without standing in between our lunch and <laughs> this. Okay. Divergence is non zero, curl is also non zero. This is another example of that. Now the question is how do we write it in different uh, coordinate systems? Look at this expression. So this is curl of grade 5. Before that, uh, yeah, before I go to that, what is the curl of a gradient? It is uh, simple, I don't know whether I call it arithmetic or <laughs> calculus, okay, whatever it is. Your simple uh, steps will show you that the curl of the gradient is zero. So that's an important lesson to get. It's very easy to show. Now, what is the connection between curl and p? Let us define the velocity and angular velocity, the relation between angular velocity and velocity of a rotating system. Look at the curl of p. Curl of p can be shown to be written like this, and then you see that it has a value 2 omega. So, the curl of linear velocity gives you a measure of the angular velocity. That is why we say it is related to rotation all the time we have been telling that. This is the surface. So, this is actually another way of uh, explaining this. Again, from Berkeley series, how to explain this. You consider a path uh, C circulation and then you can put it uh, put it into, I mean, cut it into small pieces. You consider several regions of this. And you see that here, it is in the opposite direction at this, along this line. So the side is are like that. So that is why you can write it as a total letter. Finally, you can arrive at this expression. That's the connection between the line integral and the curve. You do this systematically across all this, uh, and then add them up. That is, you add them, this a dot dl of this. And then what you get is this, the component of the curve. That is another way of looking at uh, this Stokes theorem. Remember, Stokes theorem is to be written carefully, and uh, this is named after Stokes. Although the first known statement was by William Thomson, Lord Kelvin, and it appears in a letter to Stokes in 1850. This is the form in which the same thing which I have written earlier. Now there is an important thing to look at when we look at look at this Stokes theorem. We are talking about a surface, we are always talking about a surface and a curve. Here, yeah, in this case, a surface and a curve. So, what is the relation between this curve and this surface? Is it unique? Given a curve, can we say that only one surface is associated with it? No. You can consider that you take a balloon and then you can balloon or some object like this and you can see that there are several surfaces which can be associated with this particular curve. There are several surfaces which can be associated with this. It is not unique. The Stokes theorem relates the line integral of a vector about a closed curve to the surface integral of its curve over the uh, uh, cur curl over the enclosed area that the closed curve finds. I was always telling that there is a connection. In the earlier case, I was telling in divergence, the volume and surface are related to each other. Similarly, here the curve and the surface are related to each other. Any surface bounded by the closed curve will work. You can pinch the butterfly net and distort the shape, that balloon, you can put it in different ways. Any of the surface, it will work on any of those surfaces. But does it work on all surfaces? We will see that shortly. So, you know, the this is, uh, C is trans traversed one way. In this case, it is traversed the opposite way. So, we follow the right hand screw convention when you take the curve. Let's take the divergence of a curve. This is again a small exercise and uh, you can show that this is zero. Divergence of a curl is a standard, this again is standard textbook uh, derivation, which tells you an important result that divergence of a curl is always zero. You can once you understand the physical and geometrical significance, it is easy to see from this example which I have shown here.
the important points to summarize the surface s is not unique for a given c that's what we are, we are saying just now the same c can correspond to an infinite number of open surfaces then given the sense of c the direction of curl is specified by the right hand rule the surface need not be planar though conveniently we derived it for a simple circular surface the theorem is applicable only to orientable surfaces for which the normal at every point is uniquely defined what is this orientable surface all surfaces are not uh, neat surfaces some of the surfaces give us problems for example look at these surfaces okay so well behaved surface or ill behaved surface a cylinder open at both ends a cylinder open at only one end this is supposed to be this is something like topology where we talk about orientable surfaces this is a very nice picture you look at the beautiful earring this is a very nice earring and what is so special about this earring it is not obvious but it is called mobius strip this is what is called a mobius strip where you have a very peculiar surface you can easily make it you can while you are teaching you can ask the students to make it in a minute you only need a long strips of paper you take a strip of paper if you just join it you will get a ring like that that's an ordinary ring so that you take the thing and then give it twist okay instead of connecting like this you connect like this at one point the last point paste it and then ask the students to cut it the whole class will be in for a surprise so they have seen it in youtube already <laughs> okay then if there is sufficiently if you think that surface uh, surprise is not enough you take another one take a strip twist it and fix it and then cut it twice then everybody even the toughest guy who looks intellectual who is not impressed by anything is will be impressed by that exercise i think that's something you can do in your class so such surfaces it is uh, no so this is just for fun this used for various uh, ornaments and all that this is already available in the market this is the surfaces i'm talking about you see one twist at the last instead of holding like this one twist at the end topological knots are also available yeah yeah yeah, yeah. these are all available in the form of locus and not the mystery is the thing so the thing is you can uh, give it to students and ask one to paint green on the inside and red on the outside or vice versa and it will never be done because the inside and outside are so somebody said uh, how many sides uh, you know so how many sides this polygons are various polygons are the students give an answer so somebody asked uh, how many sides does the circle have that mathematical answer is infinite sides you know the polygon becoming a circle but the practical answer is two sides the inside and the outside, outside. so this does not have an inside and outside it has got a, so asher has made nice painting out of it you can look for uh, this kind of pictures this is how it looks like when you make it and you can cut it uh, once or twice or something when you are free after the now that it's vacation after the exams you can look at this uh, asher's uh, paintings and pictures which will be very nice a mathematician confided that a mobius band is one sided and you will get quite a laugh if you cut one in half for it stays in one piece when divided this is what i was asking you to you can have a three dimensional version of this is called planes uh, bottle okay now what is it that even if you forget whatever i said so far what is it that you should take home the take home message is that vector calculus is easy interesting and is our friend rather than our enemy how do you make an enemy how do you kill an enemy you make him your friend when the enemy becomes your friend okay if he may not become your friend as an enemy but at least he will be different that's our uh, hope so the expression now the question is to write the expressions for curl in uh, uh, different coordinate systems how is it done it is very difficult very complicated how can we do it without the help of uh, going to those logarithm tables or some i mean wherever it is available let us look at what it is the curl is written like this in the row 5 said system in the cylindrical polar coordinate system okay so the easy way to understand is this see you you take this this way you understand it this way this is e rho d by d rho of this then e5 1 by rho d by d5 of this quantity e6 d by d set of this quantity and once you do that the only thing you have to remember is what is this e rho d by d rho how it comes about and e5 1 by rho d by d5 how it comes about that is clear from the way we do differential coordinates systems in the beginning and then of course that is uh, easy 
once you take that of this quantity this quantity is easy to remember standard okay so the difference comes from here for example this quantity that is what makes the difference in this case once you look at it this way and if you know the basic uh, the ideas of this you can derive it at any point you don't have to remember this uh, expression for curl some details uh, for curl this is uh, for uh, i think this is something which i have shown here so we can actually work out every step and show that it is equal to the whatever standard expression we have so rho phi z each one you invoke this and then work then uh, cylindrical polar uh, cylindrical polar is what we are discussing and uh, yeah so this is finally what you get it is these things which make the difference so pay attention to this once you know this the rest this can be easily remember the other can one can be easily remember and finally you get the correct expression similarly for r theta phi so what will you do in the case of r theta phi remember this so we have to concentrate on that difference here d by dr 1 by r d by d theta and 1 by r sin theta d by if you remember that the rest is easy so this part is uh, standard and what you get you can go through the steps if you do this correctly then you will get so that is my so i hope uh, you find it at least a little bit more interesting than what you were thinking earlier and that was my learning objective thank you